a broadcaster with the BBC for many, many years. I was uh, um, an executive producer and presenter at Granada Television for a few years, many years ago, and managing editor of the Manchester Evening News, uh, amongst other things. So over the years, I've bumped into Andy on many occasions. I think our first encounter was when I was a broadcaster and Andy was editor of the diary in the MEN and he went around the city trying to dig dirt on people who were broadcasters. Um, I think I've just about got away with it, but I've known Andy for many years. And um, every time anybody had any dealings with Andy or over those years, he said, you should write a book one day. How many secrets are you keeping? Well, that day has arrived and hopefully we can get some secrets out of him. I just want to start by... um, saying how thrilled I am that this book has been published because it's both a a chronicle of the sociology of Manchester, it's an entertaining book, and I'm no doubt whatsoever that at some point in the future it's going to be a textbook because it is a work of beauty. Um, It's the story of Andy Spinoza's participation in Manchester's story from the punk era to the pandemic. And I'm just going to start the event by reading one of the reviews. Spinoza has had a front row seat and been witness to many of the innovations brought about by visionaries, icons and sometimes pantomime villains. His access all areas work has given him a unique perspective that crosses all boundaries. For 40 years, he's been an observer, a confessor, an influencer, a player and most importantly, a peerless chronicler. He weaves his way through football, fashion, food, politics and light touch sociology, all to the backing track of Manchester's music scene, effortlessly showing us how a city's cultural development can be all pervading and transformational. That's not the very latest review. I think the very latest one was in the Times Literary Supplement, wasn't it, this week? Uh, But that was, I thought, a fantastic review. Uh, I think you'll agree with that. Do you agree with that? Yes, yes, that's one I wrote for for Amazon after I'd bought the (laughs) book. It's part of the one I wrote for Amazon. So let's get cracking. So to reference a chapter towards the end of the book, Andy, can a city function and thrive without a strong and constantly evolving cultural activity? Well, I think for people who who use libraries and read books, you know, culture is is critical to to the life of the city, and it's. It's no surprise, I think, that Manchester has become such a, um, you know, a magnet for, especially young people, uh, in the last over the last ten or twenty years, especially, or even before that. You know, because I came in '79. I came, you know, not because my university promised me a great uh, ed- education or career prospects, but because of because of music. You know, um, so I think. The culture of a city is critical to the to the enjoyment of it, um, and I'd like to think that cities that aren't as sort of high profile as Manchester have got interesting things going on in them. Um, I don't know, you know, I don't know what it's like in Hartlepool or Doncaster or or, or places in the north that are supposedly left behind cities. Uh, clearly, they haven't got the same kind of cultural uh, excitement on the face of it, the Manchester has. but And that's why those places lose their people to places like Manchester or London. So, um, you know, it's a big question and I've just scratched the surface with that answer, really. Oh, perhaps we'll touch on what happens when culture and politics and big business collide or can't get on. Uh, I think mean, you'll have seen lots of that. So let's just get a sense of the boundaries and your definition of Manchester. Obviously, the book's Manchester Unspun. Is it Greater Manchester? You reference Northwest Development Agency. Does it include Altrincham? Does it include Salford? Yeah, I think um, at the start of the book, um, I, 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 I kind of have an introduction, then I kind of say, well, hold on a minute. Before we get into it, here are some definitions. And I talk about the different types of Man- the different Manchesters that may exist um, in a sort of understood in a publicly understood way because quite often um statistics about manchester are purely city center sometimes they are more greater manchester but also what you've got developing as i'm sure you've all seen is a kind of a manchester salford dual center going on uh with people live and and including parts of Trafford from the city centre up to the football and cricket stadia. And that's kind of a new area that doesn't, that doesn't really 
uh, adhere to administrative boundaries. So if you're coming from another city in the world uh, and you're traveling around Manchester, you want to, you get a, you get a taxi or a tram to Media City or to Old Trafford for a football match. To you, it's just all Manchester. You don't know you're crossing boundaries. Um, and I think Tony Wilson always said, you know, when he used the word Manchester, he meant the whole Greater Manchester, <laughs> South East Lancashire uh, area. And I've just tried to, I think, disentangle some of these uh, different Manchesters that may exist. The book really is about Manchester, is, whole, is mainly about Manchester city centre, and I include the Salford centre as part of that, um, because that's the main focus of the development, uh, the property development, the culture, that's really where that you got a, a tight focus of activity, um, but it does, you know, it does stray into into uh, a bit of Rochdale here and a bit of Wigan there. You say that, but if you're in Rochdale and you say I'm going to town, they don't mean Manchester City Centre; they mean Rochdale Town Centre. Same with Oldham. And uh, when I was at the MEN just after your time, we had uh, a couple of titles out in Lancashire: the Rossendale Free Press and the Accrington. Observer, I think it was. And when we were taken over by Trinity Mirror, the, the big encounters from London came up and said, if we were to close the Rossendale Free Press or the Accrington Observer, how many advertisers would morph across into the MEN? And we said, absolutely none, because they don't associate themselves with Manchester. That, that's an extreme example of Lancashire, but I think Oldham, Rochdale, even Bury uh, and Haywood and places like that don't necessarily no, no, align I mean, themselves. So obviously, you've read the book, so there is there is a lot in there about the, the tension between the outer and the outlying boroughs and Manchester City Centre and what's led to devolution because all those uh, councils thrown their lot in with city centre, with Manchester City Council, mainly um, a pill, a bit of pill to swallow for some of them, um, but that has been sweetened by Manchester Airport dividends because um, all the councils get a percentage profit from Manchester Manchester, sorry. And then Manchester, somebody came up with Manchester the... Airport dividends, I should say. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so basically, the success of the airport has given um, has been a massive structural boost to the councils coming together to say to the government, "We want Greater Manchester devolution." But the main point, I think, everyone realizes is that all those boroughs, uh, the, especially the northern ones, have yet to really share in the um, in the <laughs> the real dividends, if you they've like. They've not fallen in love with it, have they yet? Well, they've not seen the benefits for their for their people. Um, and I mentioned Wigan earlier because I write about Wigan as being surprisingly the real kind of uh, um, glue that kept devolution to, to going because of a guy called Lord Peter Smith who championed the devolution dream. And um, he was the leader of Wigan for many, many years and lived long enough to see devolution come about. And, you know, if Wigan, which is sort of almost halfway to Liverpool, let's face it, you know, uh, the western wingtip of Greater Manchester and furthest away from Manchester uh, Council itself, that if Wigan could throw their lot in with this kind of growing Manchester mothership, he argued everyone should, and he, won, he kind of won that argument helped by the airport money and then someone came up with a phrase the city region which uh, is a catch-all uh, for everything so so uh, i want to talk about what's in the book but before we get into that i'm just interested in how the hell you went around about writing it because it's huge it's so detailed i mean if you, a have you got a photographic memory b have you got secret diaries squirreled away everywhere how what was the process yes, how long did it take you um so first of all um you know, I'm comfortable writing. I used to write features when I was a journalist, and um, so I'm comfortable writing two, three, four thousand words. That was what I really enjoyed doing. And so, in a way, what I've written is kind of 24 feature length chapters that you of the kind of style I suppose you might see in a Sunday Times magazine, or if I'm sort of, you know, uh, picking myself up to that extent, that kind of that kind of treatment of, of a subject. Um, and then once, to me, yes, the memory was, uh, I was a diarist on the Manchester Evening News for 10 years, so I would go to parties and meet people and remember what they said and sort of run around the corner and scribble it down or go home at night and 
remember it in the morning because I was really um, your job as a gossip columnist is to is not really to report anything factual but just little jokes and conversations and exchanges um so i i had a trained mind for that sort of thing so when graham stringer entered the midland hotel uh, in about the year 2005 uh, uh, and said the same 50 people have run manchester for, forever and they and they always will do or so, it's not an, i don't uh, not the exact quote it's in the book you know i remember stuff like that but also in terms of written material, I had uh, City Life magazine that I set up. I had 15 years copies. Um, I, would, I had Manchester Central Library for the evening news when I was writing my stuff and also others, uh, you know, sort of hard news as well as my stuff. And also um, as a PR company boss, I had masses of um, cuttings from newspapers when... I worked on things like the launch of Urbis, the launch of the Lowry Centre, the congestion charge controversy, the super casino that never was. The, and I had all this stuff, you know, um, not in hard copy, but on that was that was scanned and sent to clients. And it had dates and names and facts and figures and money. And it just seemed like a gift to me not to sort of put it all together. And it was COVID and I had nothing else to do. So, as if uh, a planned segue has just occurred, chapter 13 on page 196 starts like this. The same 50 people run Manchester. They always have, said the doleful voice behind me. I turned to see the North Manchester MP, Graeme Stringer, who had entered the busy function room in the Edwardian Baroque splendour of the Midland Hotel, the milk chocolate masterpiece where Rolls met Royce in 1904 and ever since has been the meeting point for the city's great and good. And the reason I was able to reference that so quickly was that was on page three of my notes. So we're jumping ahead in the conversation here, but we may as well... I just while, had one little thing. I've it. been told by many historians that... It's only reputed that Rolls met Royce, and therefore, in the paperback editions coming out, it will say where well, Rolls was reputed to have met Royce. Apparently, that's one of those they may have done. How disappointing! I know. How disappointing! But anyway, I wanted it to be as well, accurate as possible. What about the myth that uh, Hitler had told everyone to spare the Midland Hotel from any bombing because he wanted it for his headquarters? Is that a myth as well? You're telling me it's not in the book, so it, it must have been right. Right. I, I thought better of that one. So I, I was. That title is uh, of the of the chapter is Mank Mafia on the Med. Yes. So let's jump to that then. Uh, we, we will have to jump around now rather than do it chronologically. But um, you went to Mipping, and having read the book, it's the first time I've understood what Mipping stood for, and it's a French mm -hmm. phrase, and, and it's about um, property. It's a property fair, isn't it? And you, you speak very eloquently and colourfully about actually there was a Mank Mafia, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, apart from a, some certain individuals. But if you spool forward, what we enjoy now was spawned then. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've tried to be quite even-handed, and I'm sure there'll be people who who are upset on both, you know, commercial uh, commercial side of property development might think I've revealed too many um, secrets or been too hard and people who feel there shouldn't be any development apart from social housing um, and the developers are being let loose all over Manchester, ruining it, they will feel I'm not strong enough. But um, I've tried to walk the walk the line and see both sides. Um, I think it's... It, it, and also later on in the book, I quote um, Sir Norman Foster, the world's leading architect, who who says... Uh, it was when asked why he's never worked in Manchester to any great degree, he, he said, well, he, he didn't say, he didn't use the Manchester Council uh, specifically. He said, people like to work with people they feel comfortable with. And he was implying, I think, that Manchester Council worked with a limited group of architects, consultants, developers um, to get to get things done. So, um, and I spend some time, don't I, um, describing some of these characters, sometimes to humorous effect, um, sometimes to more, um, you know, inc inc incisively critical 
reasons. But um, I think you know it's 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 not me being controversial. Um, many academic and media reports have identified a kind of a golden circle of developers and consultants who are main who are res mainly responsible or the, have pro produced the greatest number of buildings be between them um in such a short space of time i mean one thing that is worth thinking about one of the reasons i wrote the book is you know if you can remember back 20 years um in manchester city center um there were a few tall buildings I, I launched the Beetham Tower in 2007, and then by the time it opened in 2008, uh, there was a crash. The, the economic crash meant no built, no tall buildings, or hardly anything was built for five years. So all these buildings we're seeing now have sprung up in the, only in the last decade. Um, and that growth, you know, that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. I wanted to sort of get across um, and understand the the history of the the city and how and kind of under, try and understand how that happens so quickly and you know one of the reasons it happens so quickly is this very very tight knit kind of machine uh between council and private sector which has delivered this uh, sort of jaw dropping growth that we see today so let me take you back there for to 1979 when you came up to go to university here. Did you uh, think at that point that this was a murky city, which this is something you refer to with a direct quotation from the 19th century, um, a murky, dirty city out of which could, could flow gold? <laughs> well, certainly not. I mean, that was obviously from the uh, early... 19th so century, that yeah, was a, yeah. But, but, it, but in layman's but terms, did you come here and think? No, of course not, no. This I mean, this a... was, I was 18 and just wanted to go to see bands and fall out of nightclubs, you know, uh, like any young person. And um, no, I mean, who could, who could foresee not only the kind of prosperity that you see today, but also just technological change, you know? Um, no, no one walked around with cameras in those sort of places in those nightclubs, and I, I tried to get across what it was like being a eighteen-year-old going to uh, going to uh, living in Hume, going to city centre. Hacienda opened very soon, you know, eight, nineteen eighty-two, and there was no one in the city centre. It seemed, it's certainly in those parts of the city centre. You know, I was chased around Castlefield after a football match uh, once. It was like the Warriors movie because it was just w decaying, empty warehouses, no lighting, um, and it just looked. I mean, it was, but it was as I write, it was aesthetically very thrilling experience, um, and we kind of felt like we owned the owned the place because there was no one else there but were you like tony wilson who's only had two mentions so far but many more to come the leading man of the book yeah um were you of the same mind as him that great things were just around the corner you know you'll remember wilson no doubt saying to you as he did to many of us he'd come back from america and he'd come across this little contraption and he said your whole record collection will be on this one day you went, yeah of course it will tony and he, and he flew with ideas here and there as, as i'm sure you all know but were you that type of person? No, who no I don't credit myself with any of that. I was, uh, I was, in, I met him and was in his orbit. And but I was, so I was um, fascinated and enthralled to listen to that kind of thing. I'm just a kid from London who didn't know what he was doing with his life and was just hanging out in Manchester. So I don't um, credit myself with any far-seeing um, visions of what Manchester could be. But of course. Not only was he ten years older than me, but he also was very, very well read and knew of Manchester's history in detail, and could never understand. Well, to be honest, he made most of it up. Yeah, but he, but he knew the first computer was invented in Manchester, which no one talked about at the time. Ha, and... Let me stop you there. Okay. There's a great quotation in the book about you coming to Manchester University. The child of the baby is the father of the World Wide Web. That's because Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the World Wide Web, 
as the child of two scientists who worked on the baby computer at the University of Manchester. Well, in fact, it was at Ferranti in Oldham, but it was the, it was the spin-off of the University of Manchester computer. Did you know that or did Wilson tell you that? No, I actually... <laughs> do you know what? I knew that and I told... Anyway, it didn't come from him. Yeah. It didn't come from him. And, I actually worked that one out for myself. And, I, no, I did. That's probably the only thing in the book that I did. It's worth buying the book for that, then. Yeah. So, um, not a bad one, is it? No, it's a belter. And to come full circle, the Ferranti plant that you mentioned in Oldham is now the MEN offices. Okay. On the well, printing press. That's so. interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, who can we blame or give credit to for the perception the world has of modern Manchester? I've got a few names from your book here. See if these are, you know, guilty or otherwise. <laughs> Kevin Cummings, Tony Wilson, Howard Bernstein, Ian Simpson, Peter Saville, Tom Bloxham, Jim Ramsbottom, uh, Dodd and Rashman, Peter Saville, John Whitaker, Bruntwood, Manchester United, Manchester City. Who is it? Well, it, de it depends who you are and where you are. If you are in India, you, your view of Manchester, and you're a mad cricket fan, which tens of millions of them are, your view of Manchester is possibly... Um, influenced heavily by the uh, Lancashire Cr County Cricket Club ground with its homage to um, the containerization at uh, Salford Keys and the Hacienda with this kind of post-industrial. Uh, so, you know, it's not one view, there's not one image of Manchester anymore. I think what I write about me uh, seeing photos of Manchester in the music press in the late 70s and it acting like a kind of alternative tourist board i had to come look i had to go and as an as an alienated 17 year old i had to apply to the place that looked like it was falling down and was grim um because there seemed to be interesting things coming out of it um i think all those people have played their part in either physical physically changing the city or producing imagery uh that made people think that Manchester is an interesting, interesting place. And, you know, I do think that the combined works of, of Peter Saville, Factory Records and the Hacienda has worked on imagination, imagination of people around the world over a 30, 40 year period to say this is a place where interesting things happen and to do things for the city that no amount of, uh, you know, a typical way a city promotes itself is sort of adverts airports and brochures and let's go to a conference and tell them what a great city we have you know Manchester hasn't needed to do any of that because it's produced this homegrown culture that has just churned out interesting stuff that interesting people around the world and decision makers think wow that city's got something, something about it so where does that cultural activity fit alongside how comfortable is it or how appropriate is it to sit alongside, let's say, um, the Pankhursts for what they did, Turin? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a and, and it's, many others. It's a continuum, you know. It's a continuum. I mean, all these things happen in Manchester. Um, you know, someone else writes about, which I've quoted. You know, centuries of history colliding in in one street. Uh, on at the university, um, Wilson used to say. We split the atom, um, I can't remember the name of it, it's just off Oxford Road, we split the atom on that street and the computer was uh, invented there and now I've got this graphene, you know, the thing. You, see, you know, in America, they would have put a whole, they would have put a, a whole, uh, you know, park. theme park up around that and yeah. British being very reticent, we, ne we never did that. So how does it fit? I just, it just all fits into this amazing uh, continuum of, of, of Manchester. So, 1979, he came. Those of us who have lived around here a long time will remember it was dreary, as most cities were at that time, and therefore a metaphorical kind of blank canvas for all this to have happened mm. on it. Which brings me to, you know, something very personal when you discovered that you were adopted and you describe, rather than um, agonise over that in a negative way, you describe that as allowing you to be a blank canvas. Yeah. So, if to stretch the metaphor, you almost invented yourself up here didn't you totally and i think um i mean firstly 
cities and universities and places, you know, when you when you leave a town or, or, and, and leave a place, go to another place, and you're young, you have a chance to reinvent yourself. And Manchester gave me that opportunity. Um, I did find out I was adopted, and I've got two bro- two brothers who are not adopted, and you know they had <laughs> they had problems with my father that I never had. I was kind of it was almost like they were uh, there were stags fighting each other, and there was a kind of a macho thing. But I was just sort of left alone um, to do my own thing, which is what I did. I went to Manchester, and I think cities allow allow you people to experiment and uh, and almost to get lost. Back in the day when you could get lost, <laughs> you can't really get lost uh, that easily anymore with uh, with social media, which I think is a shame for young people who uh, might like to, you know, experiment or just um, not feel um, obliged to behave in certain ways. Now, every time someone goes out and uh, has a night out, there are f- photos of them. Uh, it's hard to, you know, it's, so we're, we're in a different, we're in a different age now, but I was able to absolutely form a new identity, I think, or just create, um, you know, to create a solid person around uh, uh, in a, in a space where there wasn't, there wasn't much. I think when you, when you're adopted, you don't know your backstory, which was my case, um, the case with me. Um you are in danger of this vacuum really sort of taking over your life because you're not surrounded by people who look like you. Um, and however loving and caring the people who bring, bring you up are, which they were incredibly, you still have this, this kind of uh, question mark. Um, but I think Manchester allowed me to fill that, fill that space. So I just want to touch on journalism and PR. Uh, because, uh, by the way, we've got probably another... 10, 15 minutes or so, and then the floor will be yours to ask Andy some questions. But journalism, you mentioned um, the diary at the MEN. You were a diarist, a gossip columnist, pre-social media, so people were trying to go out and enjoy themselves and have a good time anonymously, and you were writing about them in the paper. Um, and then City Life. So tell, tell us about City Life, because that was yeah. a, a game-changer for us here first, in Manchester. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean... People will remember, uh, of, a, of a certain age, will remember the phrase um, alternative, alternative media, alternative comedians, alternative lifestyles. You don't hear that phrase anymore, do you? Because the internet has enabled a million alternatives. Everyone's got their own alternative, whatever, take on things. Everyone, if you've got a blog or a Twitter feed, a Facebook, you're, you're a publisher. So, but, 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 um, certainly in the 80s and, and 90s, in the 80s, uh, there was the Manchester Evening News um, and there was BBC in Granada. But there wasn't anything um, that we as ex-students felt was reflecting, you know, I suppose it was more of a South Manchester kind of mentality, but we did sell cop- copies when we set up City Life. In North Manchester as well, you know, outposts of... You know, we are art centres and um, all all, of, all across uh, Greater Manchester. So we we wanted to bring our own uh, perception, our own Manchester to life in a in a in a magazine. And there were, you know, the Watson style magazine, like Time Out, people may be familiar with, was the was almost the accepted way of doing that because there had been a couple of alternative mags before City Life that didn't really last. Um, so, yeah, we did it. Set up a workers' cooperative, three of us. It went to 22 staff, ultimately. Then we were, we also published Gay Life magazine for the gay community. And it it did a lot. It, it had the What's On guide and it had interviews with Morrissey, that kind of thing, but it also had... This sort of uh, dirt digging. We wanted to. We felt we we were playing at it really, but I think you know we tried to do uh, exposes of dodgy councillors and dodgy property deals, and got involved in the stalker affair um, quite disastrously, really. Um, so, so it opened in eighty three. By eighty seven, you were down at the Royal Courts of Justice, weren't you? <laughs> yes. So um, I, it's probably too complicated to go into the stalker affair, but. Um, 
there was a Manchester businessman who was, uh, well, he's dead now, and I can say this, even if he was alive, he wouldn't mind. He was he was basically fitted up by uh, by Greater Manchester Police on behalf of the of the government. Um, I think it's not controversial to say that because it's been said in many national press. But he, um, the Stalker Assistant Chief Constable John Stalker, was fitted up <laughs> by the government, and because of his association with the Manchester businessman Kevin Taylor, who took us to uh, to who sued us for uh, defamation. And, um, yeah, it looked very serious for a time. It looked like we were going to lose the shirts we didn't really have. Um, well, you probably were, were able <laughs> the to. The one shirt we had. Yeah, between, <laughs> we were... So no expensive barristers? No, it was all we – we had pro bono legal um, – uh, and legal advice, but then what happened was after the preparatory trial um, activity, he uh, he was he was arrested. He was um, charged by GMP. He won the case. Was a complete uh, um, victory for Taylor, and he had bigger fish to fry. He started. He sued GMP for a lot of money. And eventually won, so he basically forgot forgot about us. Um, but these, this sort of all this complicated, quite heavy stuff was the end result of student journalists um, pretending they could mix it with with the big with the big boys, you know. Well, you could mix it with the big boys. It had a great reputation. It once I was once described in it as the Philistines, Philistine. So you were on the on the button there <laughs> after a, right after right a piece of camera and yeah. an art exhibition in Liverpool, Albert Dock. But I won't go into that. Um, so how did you feel then when it, you know, it couldn't survive as a standalone, the MEN kind of pulled it closer and then it ended up as a page on a Friday or a Saturday within the paper? Yeah, but in between that, so it couldn't survive as a cooperative. I actually had left and was a freelance journalist about a year later, the evening it went, it went into administration, then the evening news bought it and, you know, actually made a pretty good fist of it. You know, they had, they pay people properly and it was, I mean, whoever is in the room might remember City Life as a kind of a quite a thick, you know, well written, well produced magazine. Um, I think they they the Evening News owned and ran it for ten years before, you know, as you say, collapse in the title and it now just exists as a sort of brand online, which is a shame. But you know, the media's changed so much that. Um, it's just a, ch a child of its time, really. Yeah. So through the prism of journalism, you know, what was your view on, or how did you view the various incarnations of Manchester, Manchester, Gunchester, Drugchester? Um, I know you weren't necessarily at the the peak, the pinnacle of hard news, necessarily, but you were mixing. You know, uh, the Hacienda's only had a couple of mentions so far. There's a lot more to be said about that. Uh, you've got one of the original membership cards. Is it? No, number nine two three two or something. Some three two nine two something like that. How much yeah. was it to get into the hacienda? How well, much did you pay well, to get into the hacienda? I never paid to get into the hacienda. No, exactly. No, when no, I was a journalist, you get in free and lots of friends in free. But that's the problem with the hacienda. Half hardly anyone in the hacienda yeah. actually paid <laughs> to get in. Yeah, exactly. So uh, badly, uh, badly run. But, but the, the reason I mention that is you are seeing these incarnations of Manchester through a slightly different journalistic prism. How was all that? Well, it can't be summed up in one easy sentence because the Hacienda basically went through three phases. It went through the um, it went through the interesting avant-garde, um, uh, um, badly run but and not very well patronised period, and but one of the more I suppose pretentious threads that runs through this book is that you know I'm going to really. Concertina it into a phrase now. You know, no hacienda, no factory, no new skyrocketing Manchester. Because I pinpoint a lot of the um, uh, what I call a kind of a daisy cultural daisy chain or a chain reaction that leads to today, starting with starts with the hacienda and a factory records. Because really, at the heart of the hacienda was this idea to. Re, to rebuild the city, and I know it sounds ridiculously uh, hubristic and arrogant of Tony Wilson, um, who, who in the me original membership form, it says, 
intention to restore a sense of place. Yeah, and he said, you know, cities that produce great uh, pop culture need their cathedrals, and this was the cathedral. But obviously, hardly it was hardly any congregation who attended. This is in the first seven years. Then ecstasy came along, dance music happened, Manchester happened, and there was a sort of a really blissful sort of uh, two or three years before it became uh, infested with gangs and violence. And then there was a, th a kind of a final period where it kind of, kind of tailed off, really. Um, so 15 years of Hacienda, I <clears throat> I put a lot of uh, what's happening today down to some of the um, the, the intentions of the founders who who wanted to um, who genuinely thought <laughs> that a nightclub and music venue could uh, contribute to the you know the bigger picture of this, of, a, of a growth of a city, which I think they did. They absolutely did. So on the opening night, they booked Bernard Manning. And and that and I and I'm quite kind of clear eyed about that sort of Mancunian chauvinism that existed with this side by side with this very um intellectual, progressive um I think it was a sort of provocation, it was experimentation, it was um you know, the Hacienda lost eighteen million pounds over uh which is not in the the current edition of the book, I've only found this figure and it's gone into the paperback you know, over its 15 years. Um, that wasn't public money. It was in, it was the money made from the sales of Joy Division and New Order Records mainly. And they didn't, you know, because it was private, it, it was the private sector doing its thing. And it, it became a sort of a cultural movement that didn't... Um, want to fill in Arts Council forms with um, uh, policies about who and what is correct. And I think a lot of a lot of what they did uh, would today be, you know, probably victim of cancel, cancel culture, you know, not just Bernard Manning, but yeah, there was um, there was a there was an anything goes um, approach, which, as we know, had some bad effects, but that is a that's a fact. That's it was a it was um it was a, an anything goes culture it, in an in an intelligent in in an interesting way. Yeah, but I think the word you use there, the, the provocation, that the provocation is a is a completely apt word for all that happened at that point. And then um, to segue, you know, through a few years, it was went from the hacienda and that provocation to the George Foreman Grill. By now, Andy is running a PR agency called Spin, which is a great name for a PR agency. And your first big client was the George Foreman Grill. Yeah. See, a pinnacle of your career. Yeah. Well, so just to fill in, um, so post City Life, I became a freelance journalist. I started working for Even News. I became this diary editor, did that for uh, Even News for, for 10 years. And then I applied to be the new editor of the evening news and i didn't get the job and i and it was quite right of them not to give me the job um but i was also um friendly with uh some people in the music business and they said why don't you set up a pr agency so, and i and i did and so yeah actually the first two jobs were at the same time it was launching the mail maison hotel in uh, across the road from piccadilly which is cool very cool um it was a it was a lovely old building that had fallen, was falling down and the NCP were going to bulldoze it for a car park and it was spot listed by a guy called Dominic Sagar who was an original member of the Hacienda who uh, made sure it didn't get knocked down and it then became this lovely hotel. So we did that and also uh, George Foreman, lovely man, spent a few days in London with him. Um, we got him on the Jonathan Ross um chat show on bbc one if anyone remembers that and um we were gobsmacked when jonathan ross brought out his own grill that he'd bought on holiday in america and started um just demonstrating it and jonathan ross turned to paul mccartney so there's george foreman there there's paul mccartney there, says you might have sold 500 million records but you haven't even got your own grill have you and uh, 
So it was del- that was a really great start to PR. All the all the crap came afterwards, really. That was, but it was a good. It was, it was, a, it was a good old launch pad. And that wouldn't have happened on ITV because of product placement rules, whereas the BBC the B- editorially. justified it editorially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Um, and then when Spin became SKV, the equally sexy congestion charge was one of your things to look at. We don't necessarily go into that in great detail because no. it's, um, it's long gone. It was, but... it was an interesting time, though, because just to quickly say, so uh, we work for the... So very quickly after doing some celebrity PR, we became we came to the attention of the authorities in, in a good way, and so we started working for Marketing Manchester, the tourism body, and also various public bodies and the transport arm, um, Greater Manchester, uh, TFGM. It was then was was um, having a lot of trouble um, with local media, the congestion charge which didn't come into into Manchester, obviously, was, I think, an early... It was like a forerunner of the culture wars that we see today because the Manchester Evening News uh, were against it and it became a kind of... It almost became a class war because it was, it was deemed that... So established media, including the MEN... Um, Played up the played up the, um, the disbenefits, the disadvantages for uh, for lots of its readers, and it became it was a for those of you who remember that time, it was it was quite a, um, uh, a toxic atmosphere in Manchester, which um, eventually went to a vote which the authorities I don't think were wanted original wanted originally but were forced into referendum and it was sound it was soundly thrashed and has then popped up again recently with Andy Burnham's attempt for a um a clean air zone and uh there are a lot of white van uh trade people trade people in Great Manchester and that one's also got kicked into the long grass so it's 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 got a long history this kind of problem I'm very conscious of time. Uh, I did want to reference football, actually, because um, there will be many Inter Milan fans in tonight, I'm sure, uh, and want to get back to watch them beat City. Yeah, we're going to let you get off at seven, so <laughs> you can all go back. But uh, So I, I just want three kind of anecdotes from you before we talk about Burnham and the future very quickly because I do want to give people an opportunity. So in terms of the treble, which may or may not happen tonight, you were involved with Ferguson's testimonial as a PR man, weren't you? Mm-hmm. Include during that year. So by the time you started it off, and by the time you finished it, they'd won the treble. Amazing, amazing coincidence and oh, good fortune. Yeah. And <clears throat> you put your city, Manchester City allegiances to one side. Yeah. Because Fergie's got lots of city supporting mates, and uh, yeah. he was he was just happy to have someone do the PR. So yeah, got on with him fine. Yeah. So if City do win tonight, you'll remember. I remember where I was the day City won the treble. We were in Altrincham Library listening to Andy Spinoza. You referenced uh, Terry Christian in the book once about when he was a young lad, he bumped into Matt Busby and Joe Mercer in Longford Park, I think in Stretford. Yeah. Uh, asked, they asked, he asked him to mind his ball while he ran home for a pencil to come back and get the autographs. Amazing story. And that happened. Well, you know, it's. It, I just thought when I, I read his autobiography and... I just had to put that in because really I was showing, trying to show how football, you know, had changed so dramatically and you never, uh, could never hope to see Ten Hag and Guardiola walking through a park in Manchester chatting. Um, and uh, hanging around while you went home. Yeah, for yeah, and waiting while you went, <laughs> looking after your ball. It's, it's a lovely anecdote, it's isn't it? Story. Yeah, I've, I've made Terry, you know, I've, I've, he's uh, got, a, he's got the, um, the benefit of me. Yeah. Promoting his book. That's yeah. right, yeah. yeah, yeah. You, you tell the story better than he did. Um, and, of course, that was just before the gates were beginning to close at the cliff and Platt Lane and we weren't allowed to go and watch them train. And it did, it, it changed massively. Um, so, so we'll leave football there, but um, I, I've seen Mick Hucknall on telly in the last few days. He seems to have be been reborn or a new album or something. He's appeared on daytime television. That, yeah. And I had no idea until I read your book. I mean, I'm familiar with Mick Hucknall, clearly. Yeah. And the Frantic Elevators, I actually played in a band on the same bill at the uh, Band on the Wall once. So I'm virtually related to him. Um, but I had no idea of his and his management people's influence in the, in the infrastructure in Manchester. 
and and also therefore uh, the band on the wall success. Yeah. I mean, it is, yeah. I, 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 in the book, I just draw a distinction between the kind of uh, pop uh, musician who a lot of people in Manchester and everywhere around the world think are proper Manx. And you can guess who I'm, you know, talking about Oasis particularly, uh, you know, who, who left Manchester as soon as they could. Um, and someone like Mick Hucknall, whose who's, who's money, whose personal money went into the Mail the Mail Mason Hotel, followed by um, Barca in Castlefield, followed by Deansgate Locks. Um, you know, all that was his money and his management's and his management's money. And I'm not saying uh, you know he had this uh, this great commitment to Manchester without advice and without being um, you know without being part of a group of people but it's a fact and those um developments were really quite crucial at a time when manchester's regeneration was the city center regeneration was quite fragile <clears throat> it wasn't all singing or dancing it wasn't there weren't many people living in the city and it was often described as lights the the uh, apartments that went up a lot of them the lights were out at night i.e they they weren't all selling and um you know, it's been a slow process, but I think it was it is interesting to me that it was a bit of an unknown story that Hucknall's success and his personal uh, investment got into uh, these Manchester developments. Yeah. It was an unknown story to me too. I enjoyed reading that. Also, I didn't know about the uh, antithesis. If that's the, no, that's not the right word. Antipathy mm -hmm. that exists between you and the uh, acting superstar that is Christopher Eccleston. Well, it's between him and me, from him to me. Right, yeah. Not the other way around. Well, I, took, I wrote... I wrote a chance to put the record straight. No, no, I wrote... Before they read the British the Robert De Niro and a really uh, a great actor and um, blah, 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 blah. But uh, when I met him, he... He, um, he wasn't happy. He put me over a bonnet of a car and shouted and shook me very warmly by the throat, uh, as Elvis Costello lyrics ha have it. And he's a big Elvis Costello fan, as, as I am. And he shouted uh, at me, if you write about me again, you bastard, I'll have you. <laughs> anyway, so when he became Doctor Who, I would tell my kids that I've had, I've had, a, I've had, a, ruckus, I've had a ruckus with the, with, <laughs> with the Doctor. Right, very, very quickly now, in a couple of sentences, that we could have done more on this, but Burnham, uh, dissolution, devolution, descent, lots of Ds. Where's it going? Well, since the book's pub been published, Manchester have had Greater Manchester's had another uh, layer of uh, devolutionary powers. So, um, all the you know the the, the politicians would, would would like to see. Uh, Manchester get the kind of devolution that Northern Ireland has, for instance, or Scotland, i.e. we raise our own taxes. Um, that does work in other parts of Europe, but this country has always been so heavily centralised. Um, the question really is, will the Labour government under Keir Starmer accelerate that devolutionary process? Because as I write in the book, yet another of these... Revealing insights, Labour Council in Manchester has always had a better shake out of the Conservative governments because of, and and all Labour leaders have been uh, very, um, very limited in their in their um, devolutionary uh, 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 sentiment. And it's Osborne, it's the Tories that have given Greater Manchester uh, the powers. Uh, that they now have so and and it's and it's the, the pace setter it's the trend setter in the country it's it's ahead of all the other city regions and does andy burnham sit alongside the many historical political and social agitators that manchester has provided do you think um i i think he's too early to tell i mean obviously he, you know he's a very popular mayor and he's a very savvy politician and he uses music and popular culture as part of his appeal um, he does DJing in the Northern Quarter and talks about it, the bands that he loves. So um, he could yet be the next, you know, leader of the Labour Party and potentially leader of the nation. 
and um, if he that will be the you know the first prime minister who would have been sporting a beanie hat, flares and kickers when he went to see the Stone Roses in, in Manchester times. Yeah. Fair enough. All right, it's your turn now. Any questions for Andy? First question, uh, yeah, when Eamon was reading that list out earlier, I, I, I almost said, yeah, you know, it's a shame there weren't more female names. In the book, I do write about Carol Ainsgoe, um and her work uh, in the gay village. Uh, I do write about um, people in the council and in the Greater Manchester. The, 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 the Manchester Mafia was actually quite a um, quite an equal opportunities mafia there were plenty of gay people and there were plenty of plenty of women uh they just weren't always in the lead positions so i'm very conscious of that but obviously you can't make you can't make up names and fictitious characters just on the on the point of gender so that may culpa for that i should have included some in my yeah. list john yeah, yeah. no it's, it's 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 a good point um olympic games um while manchester was being laughed at by london Bernstein was getting on with adding facilities. Yeah, the Manchester Evening News Arena, uh, as it was, or it's now the AO Arena, isn't it? You know, was built as a sporting arena. It wasn't actually built originally for uh, concerts. Um, but that was added. The velodrome was added. Swimming facilities were added. And ev with every bid that failed, um, it, course, it was adding facilities that gave us the Commonwealth Games. Um, and I don't know if Manchester needs an Olympic, you know, an Olympic bid now. Um, I don't know. Olympics seem to bring with them, you know, a, an awful, an awful lot of, um, an, an awful lot of problems. What Manchester has got coming up this year in the next, maybe the next 12 months is over 600 million pounds worth of new entertainment facilities with the, um, co-op live stadium uh, arena next to manchester city factory international and 50 million pound upgrade of the arena you know manchester seems to be betting the house on entertainment and culture and um uh, you know the book talks about <laughs> this kind of bookends really the factory records nights in a social in a bus driver's social club in hume in 1978 ending up at factory international uh, th uh, 311 million pound leading edge venue opening later this year. So that's some kind of crazy, crazy paving path from one pl one place to another. <laughs> Does he sound uh, like a monk? I, I still I still say Castlefield. Uh, and my, I've got three daughters who say Castlefield. Uh, whether I'm a mank or not is up for is for other. It's maybe is for manks to say. I think you know what a mank is these days is is open to all kinds of interpretation, isn't it? You know, I mean, I see I see all kinds of uh, nationalities in the city centre. Obviously, a lot of them are students. You know, I've seen recently a couple of guys walking through Greengate, you know, full Arab uh, headdress, you know, the full uh, the, the, the white robes from head to foot. I mean, in Greengate, you know, Salfordian uh, light engineering district, as I remember it, <laughs> mainly where the, bu where the buses are. Uh, I think... Um... So Manchester has changed. And I think at the end, I try and give a kind of a... Um, a, a description of um, of how difficult it is really to call yourself to for to be named a mank these days. Having said that, the nice way of rounding it up, I think, is you were adopted as a child, and we've adopted you again as a mank. Andy Spinoza. Thank you.